that's so nice of you. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. How many of you know that today is Human Rights Day? Yeah. Hi. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> so, um, happy Human Rights Day, I guess you could say. And uh, I'm Ann Pasternak, and I'm the new Shelby White and Leon Levy Director of the Brooklyn Museum. And I'm really excited that this is one of the first exhibitions that I get to introduce here at the Brooklyn Museum and that I get to introduce tonight's conversation. I'm going to get to you two in a moment. Um, so there's no better way to celebrate Human Rights Day with them, with all of you, and with the opening of Agitprop, an exhibition that explores artists' contributions to social and political change and a conversation on the most urgent social and political issues of our day. For the past hundred years, Agitprop has directly reflected the intent of this work. Our show connects this contemporary art with historic moments and creative activism. It opens tonight with works of 20 contemporary artists, many of whom are here this evening. If you're here, can you just like do this? <laughs> Yay, artists. Um, I hope that you've had a chance to see the show on the fourth floor in the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. And if you have not yet, do not worry. I encourage you to do so after the talk. We'll keep the museum open until 10 p.m. for you this evening. And I want to um, thank our tremendous Sackler Center curatorial team, Saisha Grayson. Where are you, Saisha? She's back there. Our assistant curator, Catherine Morris, our Sackler family curator. Catherine, where are you? <laughs> Stephanie Weisberg. Stephanie, where are you? Hello, Stephanie. Our curatorial assistant. And Jess Wilcox, our programs co coordinator. Jess, where are you? Thank you, Jess. I got to um, tell you, not only do they put together this innovative uh, exhibition, I have to tell you they have been absolutely wonderful to work with. I feel very, very blessed to have such a dynamite brave, courageous, creative, curatorial team to work with here. So thank you all for your work, and I really mean that. Of course, we are also very, very grateful to our generous donors. Uh, I want to thank some of you who are here this evening. Um, Lauren Embry of the Embry Family Foundation. Lauren, where'd you go? Oops, she's probably downstairs having a drink. Let her know I said thank you. Uh, the Fund the Warhol Foundation, and the Helene Zucker Seaman Memorial Exhibition Fund. And of course, I must thank from the bottom of our hearts, Elizabeth Sackler. Elizabeth, without you, none of this happens. You are a truly out of the box thinker. And if there was ever an agitator in a museum in the best of ways, it's you. <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth. Actually, as an aside, our 10th anniversary for the Sackler Center for Feminist Art is next year, and so you can expect some really tremendous programming coming out of that that will impact the entire museum from top to bottom. But now we're here to talk about two incredible artists we are hosting tonight. They are fearless champions of human rights causes, and while I suspect that most of this crowd is very familiar with the trailblazing work, I have been asked to give a brief introduction. So first, my very dear friend, Tanya Bergera, who I've had the honor of working with over the years. She's one of the leading political and performance artists of our generation. She's been researching ways in which art can be applied to the everyday political life. It was Tanya who said to me, I'm not interested in pointing at the thing, but being the thing itself. Bergera focuses on the transformation of social effect into political effectiveness. Her long-term projects have been intensive interventions on the institutional structure of collective memory, education, and politics. And she really puts her life on the line for what she believes in. And she's fiercely independent. And Tanya, it's so wonderful to have you back at the museum. Thank you. I'm not going to read your whole bio. Is that OK? It's just like too big. OK. <laughs> Dred Scott, it is so great to have you here, and I'm so glad you're a part of this exhibition. Many of you know, I'm sure, that Dred makes revolutionary art to propel history forward, and he tells uncomfortable truths to everyone. He first received national attention in 1989 when his art became the center of controversy over its use of the American flag. He's had the, uh, uh, the distinction of having President Bush declare his piece, What is the Proper Way to Display a U.S. Flag? Um, as disgraceful. And the U.S. Senate denounced <laughs> this work, outlawing it by passing legislation. 
<laughs> so the U.S. Senate also denounced this work, outlawing it by passing legislation to protect the flag. To oppose this law and other efforts which would effectively make patriotism compulsory, he, along with three other protesters, burned flags on the steps of the U.S. Capitol. This resulted in a Supreme Court case and a landmark First Amendment decision. So we have here before us two um, extraordinarily courageous artists who really believe that art matters in the world, that art contributes to social change, that art affects policy and political change. You've absolutely been at the forefront. We're delighted to have you here at the Brooklyn Museum. And I thank you for your participation. So now the two of them don't, do not know each other well, so we're expecting a really <laughs> dynamic conversation among the two of them. Hey. Thank you, guys. <laughs> yep. Um, uh, just oh, yeah. Um, so the format of the evening is Tanya is going to show us some of her work for about ten minutes, and then I'm going to show you some of my work for about ten minutes, and then we're going to talk with each other and have a conversation. I mean, I'm really delighted to to be here um, and with Tanya. I mean, she's an artist I really, really admire. And although Anne pointed out we don't know each other super well, I've been a huge fan of her work, and I, I think we each respect each other a lot. So. I'm thrilled to have this opportunity, both to, to talk with Tanya as just a conversation, and then to, you know, as, as part of Agitprop. And so that's the format, and then you guys are gonna have a chance to ask some questions or hurl comments our way after we talk for a little bit, so. Yeah, this might be the most awkward way to meet somebody, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but actually, I knew about your work without knowing it was your work when I uh, came to the Art Institute. Yeah. And I came to the performance department, they saw my portfolio and they say like, anything but the flag. There's this guy <laughs> who did this flag thing and, they was, and I'm like, okay, fine. So, so that was you. <laughs> um, um, so, okay, so I'm going to show very different pieces from different, different moments. Um, the first one is The Burden of Guilt. And it's a very old piece, it's from 98, so uh, when I, you know, long time ago. And uh, I show it just because it was the piece that made me more, you know, internationally, maybe people knew this work a little bit. But it was also the piece where I realized I was doing something wrong. And actually, I don't put that piece ever again because I think there is a period of my work that was a mistake. And that piece is one of my mistakes, I think. Um, and the reason I say that is because I felt that representing the problem was not fixing the problem. And I got much more interested in, in trying to use the resources of power than representing the effects of power. And um, so this is one of the old, uh, you know, statements I made. and. Um, yeah, so I think the idea that people can uh, engage doesn't mean that they understand, or the idea they can actually feel with you doesn't mean that they can actually go to the streets with you to change things, so that's very important. Then, um, I, um, for me also it's very, very important the fact that I work with the personal history of the people who are in part of the work, whether that be the audience um, or that be the performers. One thing that I also realized doing the series of performances I did before was that it was too easy to make it a personal history. It was too easy being a woman, especially, to make it like uh, almost a hysterical claim, right? When you talk about power, it's like, oh no, she has a psychological problem. And, and I really say, okay, how can I go away from that kind of psychological reading of my work, uh, which maybe is there, but it's not what I'm interested in sharing. So I decided not to use my body anymore, uh, and then start using other people's body. And I use bodies that have work in a specific areas. In this case, I um, is the mounted police in London. And I just gave them the instruction to use crowd control technique with the audience. Um, this is also 2008, so that was 
way before Occupy Wall Street, way before the students in London um, start going to the streets. So it was a very awkward moment for the audience because they haven't had some experience like that in real life. So basically, this is something they know from the media. So <coughs> then, the, then um, I think um, something I also try to do in my work is to have this what if moment. Um, I like to use art as a way to stage a future that you live right now, um, as a way to test yourself, your own limits, in terms of like what could be your life if you have certain opportunities that now are not in your hands. And in this case, I stage um, a podium, uh, a microphone, uh, some fake guards, but they didn't know that, um, and gave one minute to free speech and people could say whatever they wanted. And I think sometimes the piece was silent and sometimes the silence was even more powerful than the moment in which people were talking because it was a monument to fear. You know, it was a huge monument to fear. So I think this is um, also some techniques I use and um, I don't like scandal, I don't like like shock value, like all oh, no, of this but I use it as a resource uh, when it's needed. Uh, why? Because sometimes you need to bring people out of their comfort zone in order for them to open up to their own possibilities. Um, and yeah, so this is. And uh, the last piece is Immigrant Movement International, which I'm very happy I selected in part because Anne was part of that piece. Uh, like Tom Finkerpearl as well uh, with the Queen's Museum and I'm very happy to say that the Queen's Museum's new director Laura has also continued to support the project. So this is a very long-term project and I brought it here because I divide my work into uh, let's say two techniques to be classical. One is short-term work and long-term works. Uh, the short-term work is what, what you saw before which is something that's supposed to to deliver their content, their message, their reactions in the framework of an art exhibition. Um, the long-term work is supposed to enter the social tissue and try to change it, uh, which is a very delicate um, and long, patient work, sometimes very boring moments. Uh, but I'm very happy to say that, for example, a few days ago, some of the women from Immigrant Movement um, started this campaign to have cycle, to have like cy cycling uh, space in the in the street, and and it's not so much the cycling is how they feel now they can ask to people in power for what they want. And the original idea for this piece was very simple. It was uh, the fact that immigrants are stripped out of their political rights as soon as they cross a border, and with this piece I wanted to see if they could have them back. Very quickly, we can talk about all the things. Well, actually, t just yeah. tell people a little bit what what the immigrant movement international uh, well, was. I mean, how <laughs> how did it function? Because we've got a picture, but it, I, yeah. I know what the the image is of, yeah. kind of, or I have a sense that I do. Yeah. But I think people might not be familiar yeah. enough to know. Oh, this is what this yeah. was. Yeah, I think um, the immigrant movement is two things: it is uh, a space in which we try what we what I call arte util, which is art as a tool or useful art, um, which is, I, I find it very useful itself because it is a way to work with communities that feel they have no relation with contemporary art. And then you enter uh, their life through things they need. And, as, uh, and they can see art first as a way to understand the world and as a way to, to think differently about their problems and maybe come up with some different outcomes and solutions uh, instead of getting frustrated or getting scared about contemporary art. So um, we had very beautiful experiences where we had, for example, uh, a dancer who came and gave this workshop the moms were very excited, they wanted more and more and more. And then at the end of the workshop, the dancers show, uh, and what they have done the whole time is um, uh, choreographies from Tina, uh, Tina 
ba Bausch? brown yeah. and uh, pina Bausch. So, and this they knew after they already feel it. So I think this idea of feeling the work, um, understanding you part of it, and then discovering his art is also something I like to work with. I don't like people knowing his art right away. So I like that um, as it's one of my techniques, let's say. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm also going to show, I mean, thank you for that. And this yeah. is, is great. I'm going to show four works also, but I'm going to show several images. So um, this is what's the proper way to display a US flag. And because I'm showing several images, I'm going to go kind of quickly through stuff. This is an installation for audience participation. Um, and it consists of a photo montage on the wall. And the, I'll show you a detail of that in a second. And then below the photo montage, which had text that said, what's the proper way to display a US flag, there were a shelf that had books that were originally blank that people could write responses to that question in. And below that was a three by five foot flag that people had the option of standing on um, as they interacted with the work. But they could also interact with the work without standing on the flag. And so this is the photo montage. And below the text, it says, it just has images of South Korean students burning US flags, holding signs saying, Yankee, go home, son of bitch. And below that are flag draped coffins coming back from Vietnam in a troop transport. And this piece was made in 1988, and it became the center of controversy, national controversy, in 1989. Um, this is an image of the Art Institute of Chicago, which is physically attached to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where I was an undergrad student at the time. And this was a demonstration of 2,500 reactionary veterans, almost all white, and mostly from World War II and the Korean War. And they said things like, the flag and the artist hang them both high, uh, bringing back images of lynching. Um, this is uh, one of the things they, they had a uh, sign that said, let's see if this pointer works, I hope it does. No, I don't know how to make the pointer work. Um, so on the, the far left, there's a sign that says, go try it there, chump. And supposedly if I tried talking about the flag of some other country, wherever there is, that there would be armed soldiers that would be threatening me. And either these guys are really, really good at irony or they don't get irony at all. And I'm not sure which. <laughs> um, this is when George Bush called my work disgraceful, but George Herbert Walker Bush, Bush won. Um, and so I'm an undergrad art student at, at a Midwestern art school. Nobody knew who I was at all. And then suddenly the president of the United States is calling my work disgraceful. And so I'm like, wait, this is great. This is a job I want to do for the rest of my life. Uh, um, so, the Senate voted to outlaw the, the work. The Senate voted to ban display of the flag on the floor or ground. And for those who can't read, I'll just read it. It said, uh, the Senate on Thursday voted 97 to zero to outlaw displaying the flag of the United States on the floor or ground and announced a flag exhibit on the floor of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Well, I don't know much about art, but I know desecration when I see it. Said Minority Leader Robert J. Toll, Republican of Kansas, in introducing the measure, this disgraceful display needs much more than symbolic action. And so, you know, this is the most powerful country in the world. They have the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. They're running roughshod over the planet. They're threatening more war. And they're actually going to the extraordinary measure of outlawing this artwork. And so I knew, even as an undergrad, that this was an anomaly, that this was unlikely to happen to me or other artists again, but it also really showed the power of art and that that was very important to continue to do because I was a revolutionary, I was a young revolutionary at the time and I was also doing a lot of organizing the housing projects of Chicago. Um, but this showed actually that this art could tremendously matter and that I needed to do more of that as well. Um, and this is me burning flags on the steps of the Capitol. What do you do when you're confronted with an unjust law? You defy it. Um, and that resulted in a Supreme Court case, um, uh, Sean, uh, uh, United States of America versus Sean Eichmann et al. And so now you guys can do whatever you want with the flag. You can wear it on a lapel. You can put it on a pole. You can blow your nose in it. You can make art with it. Um, next work. Um, This is a project called Wanted, and Wanted is a community-engaged uh, artwork that masquerades as wanted posters for things that are not illegal that the police hassle youth for all the time. The text, I mean, it looked just like wanted posters, but the text on it would be like, you know, wanted for unspecified reasons, and then it would have just the generic descriptions, a drawing of somebody, and then, you know, very generic on Friday, July 18th, 2014, at approximately 1945 hours, a male black, approximately 19 to 23 years of age, 
was wearing a blue overshirt and black denim pants, was observed standing in front of a building at 549 West 20, 126. And then it flips the script at the end of that. It said the suspect is wanted by his family, friends, and neighbors to download copies of this poster and display it, www.wantedproject.com. And this was a project that I did with young adults who were hassled by the police all the time and uh, community activists and organizers there were community meetings and that, to talk about the, the mass incarceration and the criminalization of youth. This was a sketch session where these youth had their photos sketched by descriptions of adults that had just seen them for a very brief time that then ended up on the posters, and this was done as a performance. Um, so people could sort of start to understand how these photos are not, these, these sketches are not necessarily accurate, and they'd question the authenticity of them and how they, they function. Um, and then these are just a couple of the other posters. And all the, the text for what people were wanted for, like wanted for looking out or furtive movement come from NYPD statistics on why they stopped and frisked people. And stopping and frisking is typically molesting and violating, and it can even end up in death, as with what happened with Eric Gardner. Um, but, you know, the, the, these 43% of the people were stopped because they moved furtively. So 5 million people were stopped between 2004 and 2012. And so 43% of them because they moved furtively. And we went to various places like bodegas and delis and barber shops and nail salons and talked with people about putting these up because we wanted to change the conversation about how the youth were criminalized. And this just references a piece that's in the show um, that you can see downstairs, uh, the anti-lynching campaign. Actually, I guess I'm showing five works because I, I snuck this in. Um, I, but it says it all, sort of. It's unfortunately timely and an update of a 1920s and 30s uh, flag that the NAACP uh, put out. Um, History is a part of my work. Um, this is a photograph I didn't take. It's a photograph of the hosing of civil rights demonstrators um, in uh, 1963 in Birmingham, Alabama. And in looking at these images, I started to recognize how important um, what they were, the protesters were doing. And while you know, the image shows a lot of brutality, it also shows a lot of courage and heroism of pe people trying to overthrow Jim Crow segregation and all the violence and brutality that that represented. And so the, what these photos really begin to represent for me is people's strength and standing up to it. So I reenacted this scene uh, like this, I had a fireman turn a high pressure fire hose water jet on me and un instead of cowering from it and, and running from it, which is the smart thing to do, which is what the civil rights demonstrators did, I actually sort of continued to walk into the battering force of the water jet. And this is sort of drawing on that history and doing that sort of hands up, don't shoot, which the, the piece was presented in, in um, October of last year, so just over a year ago. And the, the, the death of Mike Brown was still fairly recent and everybody was saying, hands up, don't shoot. And so, yeah. And let's see if it... The Dred Scott Decision, Opinion of Chief Justice Taney. Transcript of Dred Scott versus Sanford, 1857, December term, 1856. Dred Scott versus John F. A. Sanford. Dred Scott, plaintiff in error, v. John F. A. Sanford. Chapter one, one. Upon a writ of error to a circuit court of the United States, the transcript of the record of all proceedings in the case is brought before this court and is open to inspection and revision. Four, a free Negro of the African race whose ancestors were brought to this country and sold as slaves is not a citizen within the meaning of the Constitution of the United States. Five, when the Constitution was adopted, 
They were not regarded in any of the states as members of the community which constituted the state and were not numbered amongst its people or citizens. Consequently, the special rights and immunities guaranteed to citizens do not apply to them. And not being citizens within the meaning of the Constitution, they are not entitled to sue in that character in a court of the United States where the circuit court has not jurisdiction in such a case. Six, the only two clauses in the Constitution which point to this race treat them as persons who it was morally lawful to deal in as articles of property and hold as slaves. Seven, since the adoption of the Constitution of the United States, no state can, by any subsequent law, make a foreigner or any other description of persons citizens of the United States, nor entitle them to the rights and privileges secured to that citizen by the instrument. Eight, a state, by its laws, passed... And so the instructions that people encountered in the booth not knowing what was going to be there were instructions on how to fill out a brief questionnaire that got into the, the relationship between slavery, mass incarceration, and, and voting. And it was an ethical question, but leading into it, um, it said, would you have voted during slavery, and would you have voted, in a, or would you vote in a segregated election? Um, and so I think that's probably the last image. And you know, I, I just wanna say that you know, I would, there's a lot to talk about, I mean, I, and I, I mean, w w I'm sure. I hope you have some questions and d I discuss. I want to actually, though, start. I mean, I, I hope we can actually talk about some of the the politics which we're actually sort of developing and fighting for in our work. But I actually want to talk about sort of you know, audience and aesthetic because when one of the things, you know, it's like I knew the the piece with the the. Um, the, the horses in, in, in the Tate Turbine Hall, that was Tatlin's Whisper Number 5, right? Yeah. And, you know, I knew of that piece a while back, but I didn't think of it until sort of I was looking at, the, thinking of this, I was like, oh, wait, there's, there's some relationship just in how the, the relationship between the audience to the art and being part of the art and not necessarily knowing what they were mm -hmm. sort of getting into. So when, when I did the Dred Scott decision piece, the piece we just saw last, you know, the audience, I think, assumed they would be sitting down there like you are, and they would be seeing a play on stage or something on stage, and then suddenly they found they were part of this experience. And so I would like to talk, like you to talk more about, you know, what made you decide to say, I'm going to tr subject an art audience that didn't necessarily know what they were seeing, or even if they were seeing a Tanya Bruguera piece, to having the, sort of the state come in and corral and control them. Why did you decide to do that? No, I think I think um, in that case um, the piece was not announced, so nobody knew I was part of the show. Uh, nobody knew this piece was going to happen. Only the curators, um, and uh, I think you know I think um, you need to prepare the audience, and sometimes preparing the audience is not giving them the fact that they are in front of an art piece. And I think that really, I mean, my experience is that they really, I want them to become citizens, not audience, and to react as citizens. Uh, and then maybe go home and think why they did or they didn't do something. And in that piece, it was very striking, the fact that people were following all the orders, except one girl. And, uh, and this is why I like to work with people who all have embodied their own job, because then these policemen who were kind of like doing their job, but they were not so like, they were just like choreographing in a way. When this girl say no, like she's like, I'm not going, the police wake up mm. and they became the repressive police that they are. Yeah, yeah. And this is why I like to work. For example, I did another piece with uh, Weatherman Underground. And, and I think people, you know, they carry the history so, so they know how to react and how to bring that history. So in this case, um, that happened. But the other thing is that um, I think I have chosen um, for a while now not to work so much with the art world audience. Um, maybe that piece was one of the last pieces I used 
our world set yeah. up. Yeah. So I think part of what I'm doing is I'm trying for a while to be away from museums. Um, or if I work with a museum, make them work in places outside because I'm more interested in, you know, in, in bringing art to other people. Yeah. In part because our art is not referring to the art world history maybe so immediately. They always are, but it's more about the history. It's about the memory, right? It's about yeah. the political memory. It's about, you know, redirecting some questions, you know. So I think in this case, I'm more interested in people who are not artists. Yeah. No, I, I think that's, you know, really important. I mean, I, you know, I tell people I show in mainstream museums and on street corners with or without permission. And, yeah. you know, I think it's really, you know, some of my work, you know, the, the really is trying to reach an audience that even if the museum were right next door to them, wouldn't come into the museum. And I, th I think that there's a lot of both importance in engaging so-called ordinary people with contemporary I've art. Kind of, I've kind of cherished the time where you knew people were doing art without permission. Yeah. You know, yeah. I kind of cherished that, like, when you were like, oh, this person did this and that, and you're like, oh. And they did it just because, and they asked. Like, I, I kind of like to go back to that. Maybe I'm too old for that. No. You're, maybe you're, some people here can do that. <laughs> uh, Art without permission. You, you younger people, do that. <laughs> you know, because, you know, there, I think there is a big institutionalization of our practice. And part of this is the fact that young artists don't think they are valuable unless they are backed up by an institution. And that makes no sense. Yeah. Like, half of my work is, you know, <laughs> so, yeah. So, I mean, speaking of not permission, I mean, you know, I guess the, the Tatlin's Whisper number six, which was in Havana, which you didn't say. The last say. one? Yeah, uh, well, well, no, it wasn't so much the, la the one that you did show, yeah. not, uh, but, but, and, and the last one. Well, well the, the first one that you showed was, it was during the Havana Biennial, right? Okay, yeah. so that was, you know, with permission, but it was not permitted. I mean, they, yeah. they didn't like what you did. Yeah. And, and I have to say that I thank Guillermo Gomez Peña because thanks to him that peace was able to happen. Yeah. Because he used his power of being like the guest uh, of the show to invite me on and they couldn't say no to him. So, <laughs> so that sometimes, I mean, I'm sure your case is the same. Like most of my work has a heavy negotiation behind doors, uh, either in my head or with actual sensors. Yeah. So I think this is something maybe we don't talk about, but it's important that people understand that, you know, you always have to well, put it here so you can do this yeah. at least, you know. <clears throat> well, let's talk about the censors for a bit, because it, it's rare that I'm on stage with somebody who has been censored and denounced by, you know, heads of nations and, and targeted and arrested. And No, I mean, that's so, I, I mean, it's something we sort of have in common. And I think that, you know, there is something both to the, the form of the work that we do, but it's more the ideas that we're talking about and, and sort of that, you know, you know, having people, giving them the freedom to talk for just a minute and say whatever they want, at least in Cuba at the particular times that you did it, was not tolerated well by the Still Cuban not government. Not. Still not. Yeah. Um, and, you know, but I, I mean, so what is it that you, you were doing that is so threatening? Why is... Well, I think... Um, well, first of all, I don't know if this is used also here, but um, in, in Cuba, every time you're going to do a critical work, they always said to you, it's not the right time. <laughs> but then I read the other day the biography of a writer who in the 60s wanted to publish a book, and they say it's not the right time. So it's never the right time. So that's why we have to do it. Uh, and forget about that. So the thing is that um, in this case, I think... I think people in power, at least in Cuba, and I think other places too, they're okay with our work that is kind of a phenomenological approach to the problem, like, oh, these are, uh, like, I'm complaining because this and this is happening. But they don't like the work that goes to what causes the problem. And I think that is when they really get threatened because most of the time they're part of the problem. Yeah and they don't want to be called out. The other thing I think happens is that many politicians do not take into consideration artists because they feel, uh, first of all, some of them, if they're not sophisticated enough, they think art has a very old uh, function, which is decoration. But um, 
many of them do not have a language to which they can respond to work that addresses them. So they basically go and censor, that's their, their instinct. So I think in this case, for example, in Cuba, um, I had more than 20 interrogation sessions and um, at some point, I mean, these interrogations were like endless, like three, four hours, like really long. And at some point it's like, I'm not going to tell you what you want because I'm not talking about that. Or I have nothing to tell you because you want me to say I'm CIA and I'm not. So <laughs> how can I am going to follow this conversation, which is absurd? But, um, and then one thing I realized, I told them one thing that happened is you understand theater because it's something that is controlled, that is very clear. And my work has uh, an unstable form. This is something I use. I use unstable forms and you get threatened. I think people in power get threatened where they cannot identify exactly what's happening. And I think that's when they come up with censorship. So at this point, I start talking to them about what performance art is, what political art, in my view, is, and you know, working without, like I, I actually was teaching. I yeah. became a professor at that point. But I think that's, that's something. I think when they, they, things are very recognizable, that's why they like propaganda so much, because it's very clear. You know, the meaning is, set, is um, contained in a very classical, specific way. So I think, I don't know in your case if yep. that is... Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, I've, I've had several works that have been threatened with censorship, and I, I think part of... I mean, I think it's more that there is a, a, a tiny handful of people who control the wealth and the knowledge that humanity as a whole has created, and this, at least in... I mean, in this country, definitely, but in the world, I mean, it, it's a society that is founded on exploitation and oppression. And when those questions get opened up for people to discuss and debate, whether, it, whether it's in a, I mean, I think even if you were showing oppressive relationship, but certainly if you're allowing people the freedom to talk about that, to, to pose that question and allowing them to talk, I mean, I, th I think that if, with what's the proper way to display a US flag, if I just said, fuck the flag, Nobody would have cared. It was, oh, it's art, we don't like it. Mm -hmm. But the fact that I was like, okay, let's have a big conversation about this, but foregrounding it in a way that people who feel that they've been victimized by America have an equal footing to share their stories with other people who believe, you know, all the, the, the that America is great. And so that debate where, where people were standing in line for literally hours, in, including people from the housing projects, that's what was dangerous. That's why, you know, Bush was, was threatened and he commented on it. But I think it really it has to do with, there is this profound exploitation and oppression in the world. And I think part of your work is making, making a lot of that visible for people, even if it's not showing it, but it is actually creating situations in which that is sort of, you know, I mean, in a certain sense. With, well, yeah. but it's uncomfortable for the audience sometimes. Yeah, it's like I'm yeah, all right, yes, them to it is. It is. As if they were free. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes wait, wait, they don't know. Say that again. Say that again. I'm forcing people like to I'm behave as if they are free. We, through the work, sometimes yeah. I'm forcing the people to behave as if they were free. Yeah. And people are not ready to be free, yeah. you know? So that's why I think art is so important. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's but almost, but is I, it, I have a question for you. Yeah. Will you ever think that some of your work could be done differently? Like, for example, the flag. Have you ever gone back and said, like, oh, maybe that's not the form? But, <laughs> that's it. What he said. Uh, so, so, I mean, I think, uh, a, yeah, I think yeah. your work is very good, yeah, 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 extremely yeah, good aesthetically yeah, yeah. And, and very precise. But I'm interested to, you know, yeah. have you... Well, I rethink work a lot. Right. And, and there's some works that, you know, I, I, I'm old enough to know that not every piece that I've done is a great piece. And there's some pieces. Same here. Yeah. Almost and, <laughs> and, you know, I think some pieces I have are really good. I actually think the, the flag work, that, I got it right. I, would, I wouldn't change that. And I've been thinking, including, like, how to learn from that and do it. But, it, you know, it, it was basically, it was, I mean, I was young at the time, but that was a work that I'm still very proud of. Mm -hmm. um, and, in fact, there are themes in, you know, in that work that I still keep mining in terms of how to activate an audience. I mean, and, and so, mm. you know, it was interesting. I mean, one of the things I say that the, 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 you know, that work is, consists of a photo montage, you know, a silver gelatin print, print books, pens, a shelf, a flag, and an active audience. And so in, in, I just want to read what some of your 
materials are, and yeah. at least on your website. I mean, it's like, you know, materials, immigration policies and laws, immigrant population, elected officials, politicians, community organizers, public pressure, media. I mean, that, that's, the, these are great, you know, it's like some people work with canvas and brush and you're yeah. working with laws and policies or. But, but that yeah. came also out of like a big um, hard time I had with people, especially like people who were talking about the work and they were trying to go to this like classical like framing and I'm like, no, my work is not about, it's about that policy, like, yeah. you know. So I start doing that and also I start creating my own concepts, like kind of, I'm not good at that, but I'm just did it as a performative gestures in which I start, for example, the first thing I did is like I studied performance at the Art Institute, so we are yeah. alumni from yeah. the same school. And um, I had a big trouble because back then it was not so open to other cultures. And I decided I'm not a performance artist, but I am a behavioral artist or arte de conducta artist. And then by now, I don't say I've been a, I'm an artist. Actually, I say I'm an initiator because um, the audience has a, such a big role in the meaning of the work that I cannot claim at all. And that also, when I talk to critics and stuff, that make them uh, at least think they don't know everything. So they have to stop and think from scratch instead of assuming things about the work. And also, you know, so I think it's good to recognize, uh, for example, when I did the Tate piece, uh, the, the horse piece, uh, the Tate acquired the piece and Part of the do they keep the cops in there and like they're, they they're, do they keep the cops in, a, well, in the if, does the registrar have a cop? Right. <laughs> <laughs> the horses are living out there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so so one of the things actually one of the point is that the perform like the police ones cannot perform more than three times because I realized that they yeah. become actors and yeah. they start believing yeah. they're an artwork instead of being the police. So but one part that was very important is I, I negotiated in the contract that they can uh, not persecute anybody taking documentation of the work and selling documentation of the work. I'm not a successful selling artist, but I hope <laughs> one day people can profit from the photos they take of my work. And I think that was just a kind of political, because that's the other thing, we're very good at being political with things outside of the art world, and I think we need to be political inside of the art world as well. And all the dynamics that we have when people are not being paid, when people are, you know, discriminated. Uh, I know it makes us less successful and less nicer to people, maybe less invitable to things, but it's important. Um, and I think in this case, I just wanted to recognize that some artists are very excited to work with audience until the economic factor comes in, and this is my property. It's like, no, I mean, they were part of it, they made the piece for you. Yeah. So be grateful at least. You know? <laughs> uh, so I hope sometime one of you can become wealthy with my photo. <laughs> when I die or something, I don't know. Um, so, <clears throat> but yeah. but I, I guess, you know, the, the, coming back to, some of the change that sort of you're trying to bring about. I mean, a lot of times, I mean, on your website and in your talk tonight, I mean, you've talked about, you know, you said that, like, you know, you tried to force people to be free, and you've talked about utopianism. In some of your Tatlin work, you, you talk about going back to a time when people actually imagined a radically different social relation. And, and you know, we're part of the, the, the uh, agitprop show, and when you guys get to see the show, I mean, they're, they're, you know, there's early Soviet work, and there's work by Tina Bonnati that, uh, you know, actually, I mean, which is rooted in communism, and, and, you know, people trying to get to a world without classes. And so I think that that's something that is, is different than what a lot of at least Western artists are trying to do. But I think, you know, all, I mean, but this question of utopia, but not just fantasy, but actually talking, working from the now to how people could actually get free. Hmm. Actually, I, I uh, don't use the word utopia itself. I use the, the phrase realizable utopias. Hmm. And the reason for that is I come from a country that is being seen as an utopic country. I'm from Cuba. And for many, many years, that was the ut utopia of everybody. Yeah. Uh, we were not really utopian. Yeah. It was very dysfunctional, but people wanted to project that. Uh, onto us. So I think in this case, I really like the idea of utopia not as the island you can never reach of perfection, but as the way um, 
and the road you take to arrive. Yeah. And I think, um, yeah, I think utopias are just the way you set up your goals and they are reachable and they should be reachable. Otherwise it's just yeah. aesthetic. Yeah, I mean, right now the the project that I'm I'm working on is a long term project. is It's called Slave Rebellion Reenactment, which is going to reenact the largest rebellion of enslaved people in U.S. history. Which that rebellion happened in 1811 outside of New Orleans, nice. and it had yes. <laughs> um, and nice. the thing that's interesting to me about this is the the goal of the rebels was actually to seize both the city of New Orleans but all of Orleans territory which was basically from Arkansas down to the Gulf of Mexico and in slavery. And while it was a long shot, it actually was a realistic chance to, to get free and to, to radically change the world. And part of doing this is the, the people that are going to be the, the reenactors are gonna be embodying this history and part of what I really want them to do, and it's not just gonna be like, you know, actors and people just showing up, it's actually gonna be people who are grappling with this. And what does this history, hmm. you know, what does this 19th century history matter to 21st century people today and specifically how do you embody that and what lessons of freedom and emancipation are con concentrated in that that people can learn from instead of just saying well you know maybe we could stop police brutality by getting body cameras or car cameras on on to w witness the murders they might say no we need to stop the police from murdering people and so i th i think this this notion of freedom radical freedom and emancipation but actually giving people the t the tools and the structures to to imagine that and work on that is really important and so you know how, and, and it's interesting because you're talking about reenactment and, and so much burden is given, putting into us about being creative and being new and all this. And I think one thing that you feel liberated when you do political art is the idea of the newness. Because you never work with the new, you work with the old. Yeah. You work with history, with memory, with people's uh, behavioral training. With, you know, so I think this is, this is very liberating in a way. Like This is one thing we don't have to care about yeah. so much. And also, I think that um, in a different way that activists do, but, but I think we, we, it's okay with uh, us to have all these references, you know? And uh, yeah, so I think it's, and actually sometimes you want that because you want people who are not artists to, to understand where you're coming from and what are you talking about because it's part of their own history. So I think that's, that's for me, it's very liberating. Yeah. But at the same time, you have to be careful because you don't want it to make it too, it's a very difficult balance because you work with things people recognize, but at the same time you cannot do it in a way that are too obvious or too, or the meaning is too like, oh, I get it. Yeah. So I think this is an interesting, I don't know how you deal with that. Like this tension between, you know, the icon and the meaning and, you know, symbol and. I'll figure it out as I go along. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, I know some of it, but part of the, part of the thing of, I think, working with, you know, collaborating with non-artists in art projects and creating frameworks for people to sort of work within. I mean, it's, I, I mean, I think with, with the immigrant movement, you didn't entirely know what, what it, I mean, you, you knew what you were gonna, you, you knew you were gonna have a building, you were gonna live with some undocumented workers, mm -hmm. but you didn't know what the needs of the community was or where it was gonna go. And I think being open to adapting to that is actually, within, the, within an artistic frame, you know, I think is really. But I think our work needs modesty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is something that our world is not used to, or doesn't recognize as a good thing, probably sometimes. Uh, but I think we need modesty because when we work with these communities, we cannot come like a messiah. We have to come as somebody who is inviting themselves, and you have to negotiate that entry. Yeah. The same way you negotiate the exit as well. I think for this kind of project, it's as important the way you get in as the way you get out. For example, right now, immigrant movement is in the hands of the community. Uh, the Queen's Museum is still supporting very, very much, but it's in the hand of the community. So basically what we did is setting up an ecology in which people knew what was and what wasn't possible, what was and what wasn't uh, their possibilities. And, um, and we set up a few things, like the idea of like contemporary art teaching, like social engaged art teaching together with activism. And that still happens. So I think is I don't know. I think it's it's important to not believe you know everything. 
Oh, or, or come like a UFO, like, oh, I do my project, go to our, we are in America, our news, our forum, and then I, I, I think that's, that I'm very nervous of that. Actually, we made a mistake, and Anne could be testifying of this. Like, we made a mistake because I think uh, we were so excited about the project that we invited the press so soon. Mm. And I had a very bad experience with um, the New York Times of everybody, which has been very supportive of me after that. But I think it was very interesting because we had the chance to choose uh, somebody like Holland Carter or the guy from the immigration department in mm. the newspaper. And of course I decided the immigration guy who knew nothing about art or think he knew, but he didn't know. And uh, that's interesting too, like when in these projects you give access to people who are outside the community and why? Why? Because the press is a tool. It's not a mean in an end of itself, you say, no? It's a, it's a tool that you have to use for the work, in order for the yeah. work to, to be properly you know, yeah. done. Or maybe the community excited because they are in the newspaper and that's something you know, good for them, or empowering, so. Yeah, I mean, but just sort of, I get the last sort of exchange before we open it up to and you I'm guys. I'm sorry to be so negative. I'm no, like, no, no, no. Everything no. is wrong in my work, but no, I have I, few I, well, things I mean. Right. If this is everything that's wrong with your work, I wish more artists would do oh. mistakes, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, and, and show them. But I, th so, but I do have a, I mean, I, I think you're really right that when you go into a community, you actually have to invite yourself in and you have to be humble and, and go in and not oversell what you can do. That said, I think that many people in this society and I think many artists, I mean, don't dream big enough. I mean, I think there's a lot of ego in the arts where people are, are, you know, just about themselves. But I think in terms of craving greatness and success, and tr I mean, it's, you know, going back to Tatlin, I mean, that was, it was part of a revolutionary society, but it was, they were actually really trying to radically transform the world. And, and the tower, you know, was, was meant to be this whole huge sculpture that, that you know, had a commissariat roving around the top. I mean, it was, it was a, a bold vision. <coughs> And I think artists actually need that, and society needs that. And while I think that you know we may fail in in attempting to do that, but I think you know, including I have a tremendous confidence in in the people to be able to to shake off centuries of oppression and to become emancipators of humanity. And you know, we need revolution, and we actually need people that come with that. And if, regardless of whether they they know it because they're artists and have studied art, or whether they know it because they've, you know, been union organized or whatever, wherever you get that spirit for the the world does not have to be this way. And a plan and a scientific understanding of that that can put in the hands of other people, including through art, then we need to actually be singing that from the mountaintops. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you guys have comments or questions, we've got uh, about tw 15 or 20 minutes maybe to, to go into that. If you have them, this is being live streamed. So there are two mics either, over on either side. So if you want to say something to us so that we can hear you, but so that also people on the interwebs can hear you, um, go to the mic and say something. Just climb over your friends. Don't be embarrassed. They don't mind. <coughs> Hello. Uh, thanks, guys. That was really great and inspiring. I guess my question is just wanting to know a bit more about you, both of you, and what you've learned about yourselves through your work. And... Also, I guess this, um, the, the idea of freedom and if, it, if you're trying to free yourselves through your work as well. Um, well, I mean, I just, I guess background, I mean, I was, I was born to a middle class black family and, and I wasn't the kid who doodled and drew. I, I ended up, uh, my dad, Prior to my being born was a professional photographer and he changed careers around the time I was born. And 
became an amateur photographer, but I say that because I grew up around cameras, and when I was 12, I got given an SLR, which, you know, not digital SLR, but an old school film analog camera. And I just took a lot of pictures, and they were, you know, just pictures when my family would go on holiday, or, or you know, when family would come over and stuff. And so I didn't really think of it much as art, and I ended up in art school kind of by accident. I didn't do well enough in, in high school to get into MIT or Caltech, and, and so um, I ended up in, at the School of the Art Institute, which was a, a really, you know, those who can't do teach, those who can't teach, you know, teach gym, and those who can't teach gym teach art. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I've taught, oh, so I, 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 I live off teaching. I know, I know. I, all my friends do. I have. It's a, um, so, so, but anyway, so I ended up going to art school, and it was the best accident that ever happened. I mean, it was really an important change in my life that was unplanned, but it it sort of set my life on a course that. I think I can contribute more to humanity that way than if I were a scientist. I think I'd be an okay scientist, but I'd probably be making some sort of widget that was not really needed or just that so somebody else can make money selling you something you don't need. And, um, you know, I, I think that the, the key question is not so much the art, but is the politics. And that, that you know, I grew up in Ronald Reagan's America, um, which was just an absolute nightmare. It was a horror. There were people on either side of the ocean that were trying to destroy the world. Um, to expand their empires, and Reagan just embodied greed and cruelty and, and you know war, and so you know I tell people Ronald Reagan made me a communist, and so um, you know and 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 finding out how to bring the the art and the politics together and, and craving a world without exploitation, without oppression, and figuring out a way to. Um, sort of have the art address that, sometimes more successfully than others, is sort of been my, my life's mission to, as part of you know, contributing everything I can to a movement for revolution. Well, in my case, I um, come up from a political family because my father was actually in politics. And, um, you know, so in the house, that's, that was normal, although I had a lot of problem with my father after he brought me to the secret police for interrogation once. Yeah, so that would that, be a that problem. Kind of it up. I'm, like, I'm like, okay, now I'm not talking to you for a while. Um, and, um, but I think what influenced me the most is like a professor I had when I was very young, I started 12 years old, also by chance because my mom needed to put me in a double session school and that was art, and so she could work very quietly. So um, his name was Juan Francisco Elso, and he's, he has been a huge influence on my work. And, and he was the professor who told me that art is beyond what you see, and it's the energy that you feel. Um, and then after that, in the 80s in Cuba, there was this very, and I always talk about this, not, most people don't know about it, but, but that's also a challenge I had coming to the United States because my influences were people nobody knew about it. It wasn't <laughs> Vito Conchi or anything. It was like... Um, well, Fredo Lam or uh, no? You know, with Fredo yeah. Lam, also but in a different way. But, but then uh, the biggest influence was in the 80s. It was a big, big um, uh, group of young artists who were doing very political and uh, con contestatario, we call it like... Uh, um, you know, against the government, or not against the government, like criti critical, and um, and that was the biggest influence I had in my life because I was very, very young and I felt that art had a meaning and art had a reason to exist. And, it, and art did actually change policy and art actually changed people's life and give something beyond. And the exhibition and the museum and all that was a frame that could be used or not for, to achieve these things. And, and all my life I've been trying to do work that made me feel the way I felt when I was in those guys' artwork as an audience. So I think that's, um, yeah. Well, just briefly, I mean, one of the early works that you did was you, you kind of created a, a, a living in Kisi power figure, yeah. <laughs> um, which, I mean, you guys, actually, they probably have some in this museum. <laughs> I don't know if they do, but they're Congo power figures yeah. that, that which I thought was really interesting, but I mean, the question of like the, the you know, the Afro-Cubans and, and... Yeah, but the thing is, being Cuban, I have been battling 
endlessly with all the preconception people have about what kind of art you're going to do. So my first decision is going to do black and white art. So no color, no palm trees, nothing like that. So, so that was very disappointing for a few people, um, especially my father. <laughs> and then, um, and then I, uh, I did only that one uh, that is very like, you know, uh, maybe, you know. Um, but what I liked about it is that it became this powerful figure that was walking the street of Havana the day of the anniversary of Fidel Castro, which is the most, back then it was the Secret. most heavy, <laughs> no, no, the most heavy policed day yeah. in the year, during the year. And what I liked is that I learned from it that this is why I think part of my work has failed, even if people really like it, and I, I know it has some good things, but it's because one of the policemen approached like a huge uh, group of people who, who were following me um, and say, what's going on, what's going on? Like super nervous, like the, he didn't understand what the meaning of this was. And um, a kid say, it's an artwork. Mm. And then the policeman think for a minute, you know, they need to think for a minute always. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they think for a minute. And he's like, okay, proceed, proceed. And yeah. I was like, I'm totally failing. This is a failure. Like yeah. I want these people yeah. to care about what I do and to engage the conversation and maybe change what they do because my work. And then this is one of the pieces that made me think all of, I mean, I'm very tragic also. Yeah. All of this is wrong, you know, like. <laughs> All of that work is never going to show it again. And then I, it made me change into yeah, like, I yeah. need to talk the language of power. Yeah. Because I need to talk to them, not about them. Yeah. So, yeah. So, next question. Uh, hi, thank you for being with us tonight. Um, and also, thank you for talking about failure and mistakes in the context of art. I think that's really exciting and important. But um, I'm sort of wondering, something happened in this last few days um, at Art Basel. There was a stabbing that mm -hmm. was considered to be performance art, but it was sort of, no one really knew what was going on. And I'm just, it's something that's been really preoccupying me as an artist lately. And so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about what the process should be for um, containing or not containing performance art specifically as a medium. Mm. Question. Well, um, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I think that artists, I hope, will always come up with new, new ways and venues to make art that challenges preconceived notions. I mean, I, I think that it says something that, I mean, and I don't know what it says, actually, necessarily, that, that in Art Basel people could think that a stabbing was an, an artwork. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I think it, you know, ultimately it seemed to be over something really petty and that people just contextualize it, oh, this is Art Basel, somebody's gonna do something like that. I mean, I don't know whether that's, if, if, if you were going to do stabbing as art, I don't know why do it in, in, in Art <laughs> Basel, but maybe, I don't, I don't know. The, but just the, to contrast that with something else that happened in, in Miami, I mean, the police actually shot an unarmed man. He was a white guy and he had supposedly tried to rob a bank, but he was stripped down to his you know, shirt and he was, had his hands on the police car. He may have had a razor at the time, but then the police just shot him and it was recorded on video. And so I, the question I pose to you, but the audience is, why is it that the art world is more talking about the stabbing that happened than the police murdering people and again and again and again and again? <laughs> We have more in common than I thought because that was going to be exactly what I <laughs> why they care so much about, you know, yeah. than the, what happened. I think um, it's not the first time that people have um, think that things are art when they are not. Um, I know that there was in fair, I think it was in Arco in Madrid where a, a, a homeless people person came and they thought it was a performance, and he was coming and eating all the, like, you know, all the, all the events and stuff, and sleeping there. And I mean, it was a big deal about it. People didn't stop him because they thought it was a performance. So um, I think it's good when it benefits people, yeah. <laughs> if they think it's performance. 
Um, but I think it's, it talks about two things. About first, how, um, I don't know the word in English, but self-indulgent maybe? We are in the art world, like self, looking at yeah, ourselves yeah, yeah, yeah. all the time, like yeah. how self-important we think we are in the art world and how much we forget what happens in the world. And, um, and if it's happening in our world of art, it's fine. But if it's happening outside, we don't care. So I think that's, that's very preoccupying. Yeah. Oh. Hi. I work in the juvenile justice system and also for an arts-based organization. And so I hear a lot of language um, that you're talking about is restorative justice based and about restorative practices. And I'm wondering about fair process with your audience and how you engage your audience. Is it, uh, what happens at the brainstorming level? At the brainstorming level? Mm -hmm. Is it an, an intentional fair process at all levels? Well, I have to be honest. Sometimes in my case, it's not a fair process. I'm, I'm honest. Uh, why? Because I want to take, peop take people off guard. Uh, so I need to look at mechanism where make them uncomfortable in order to be themselves, finally. Um, so whether that is the f uh, taking out the framing of the art word, work, whether that will be confronting them with their biggest fear, uh, you know, whatever it is. So sometimes it's not, the, to be honest, the process is not so fair. What I'm really um, hopefully fair with is the people who knowingly are collaborating with the piece. And I never ever collaborate with anybody who do not agree with the political point I want to make on the piece. Um, so that for me is a, the first thing. Secondly, um, for me, as a political artist, it's more important sometimes the outcome of the piece than the way I arrive to the piece. Meaning, and I always said this before, for me, political artists are with consequences. And I think as a political artist, you have to deal with those consequences uh, in a responsible way. Um, and, you know, and, and it, I had amazing experiences where people collaborating with me in the piece agree with what I do and even defend me in the eyes of the law or in the eyes of judgment from the audience. Um, but I always take responsibility, always. Like in Colombia, I did this piece where I um, work with these um, actors from the conflict and and then at some point, I mean, it was a kind of boring round table. Um, and then at some point, somebody came with a trade of cocaine mm. uh, and people start consuming. So for me, for example, uh, the person who did that, like everybody who was involved was agreeing with what we're doing. They knew why we were doing it. We knew what the critique was and they agree with everything. And actually these people were the ones who took me out of there before the police arrived. Um, so I think that's very important. The other thing that is important is a lot of friends were like, leave now, leave now, you're going to trouble because they wanted to put me in jail. And, uh, and I say, no, I did it. I have to stay. I, I, I'm not going to run now, you know? And, you know, and at the time I said in public that the people who were at the institution did not know anything about it, which is not true. Now I can say because so much time has passed. And, um, and that was part of it, and I had to take it all, you know, and those are the decisions that are political decisions that you make with the work that is political. So the politics do not stay only in the subject you're treating, but in the ethical attitude that you bring into um, either the process or the consequence of the work. And I'll give a quick answer to that, but I want to say that the, the next two people that are questioners will be our last two questioners because <laughs> we've got a show oh. to go see. But I will quickly answer. I mean, I, I, I mean, I think almost every sort of artwork I've made collaboratively with people has been unequal. I mean, when I work with prisoners, um, t talking about a society that locks up over two million people, but from the perspective of the prisoners, it was a real collaboration. But I was going into a prison, I talked with them to, to, so they knew where I was coming from and per, per, participated consciously and intentionally. 
but I was gonna leave the prison at the end of the day. They, they weren't. And so, you know, almost, you know, when I work with so-called at-risk youth um, to talk about the criminalization of youth, even though the work we're really collaboratively and genuinely doing, it wouldn't be the same if I, I did it myself or if they tried to do it themselves, but it, it's, they're unequal. I'm this you know, art person who's gonna sometimes be on a stage at the Brooklyn Museum. If I you know, get arrested, more than likely the, there are people who will come to my defense because of my history. Yeah, but, but at the same time, I think feeling guilty is not good. Oh, I'm not guilty. No, no, but I'm, I'm not feeling yeah. guilty, but this idea like we know our privilege and we know that we're getting yeah. in and out. I yeah. think but I think, um, I mean, I met people who have been in prison yeah. who, because our projects they did during prison changed their life. Yeah, yeah. So I think yeah, yeah. Um, maybe, I don't, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm not saying, that, okay. I'm just saying I recognize that, I'm not no, guilty at all, yeah, yeah, like, but, it, but it is just, there is a tremendous inequality that exists yeah, yeah. with a lot of the, the people in places I but work maybe with. But maybe we cannot I, but, judge, maybe the thing is that we cannot judge the equality that, that way. Um, Maybe there, we need to set up a different way to talk about because yeah. it's never going to be equal. Yeah, He's always no, going I, to be free. He's yeah. not free. So maybe it's about like what are you giving? I don't know. I, I'm just thinking yeah. about this now. But maybe this idea of what are you giving? What are they taking? And how life changed for both of you? Yeah, no. I, maybe it, that's what the quality is. Like how they change you and how you change them. I don't know. I'm just. No, I think it is. I mean, I, I hope that my collaborations are very meaningful. In fact, when working with the prisoners, I ended up meeting a guy on the outside later, and he said, look, that day changed my life. That's actually why I'm on the outside now. That's why I'm actually a leader in the community now, which is like, wow, I, I was just doing this yeah. artwork, which was in, very touching, and it was, a, um, but, so. And, anyway. and, and maybe one thing, just sorry, but the other thing is like, when, when we do this kind of uh, social engaged project, I'm always very nervous about people talking about the people they work with, but I think, in my experience, the work is successful when these people are never are not the audience, not the participant, but your friends. Yeah, they really yeah. become your friends yeah. in life. Yeah, well, so. I've picked up a couple of those. So next, yeah. next, next to last question or comment. Oh, um, first, muchísimas gracias. Ah, de nada. Por, por tu trabajo, it's absolutely amazing. Um, two questions. One is, can you talk about the tension about your work that the work that you do and the art world? And the art world. And the art world. I mean, the work that you do is political, you know, and there's the fantasy that art, the art world is not political, that museums are not political institutions, for example. So can you talk a little bit about that? And then you started to, to talk about, I, wa I wanted to hear about consequences. How have you seen the changes that come from your work? What changes have you seen that come from your work in the communities that you work with? Well, um, I think, for example, and Anne it can be testimony of this. When, um, but uh, for example, with immigrant movement, I think I think I always do a lot of work behind the scene when I work with institutions that might not be known. But for example, the fact that I make sure that people are paid, uh, the fact that I'm sure that you know, you know, um, and pay a fair amount, not pay like exactly. two dollars an hour. <laughs> uh, so that people are insured when they work with me, where uh, these are a lot of things that you talk that are political, but it's not it's in the work, but you use the leverage that you have as an artist that is being called by the institution to set up something that may be people after. You know, a lot of time I had to deal with like, we never do this kind of answer, I'm like, I don't care, like, we have to do it. <laughs> and, and then sometimes they don't want to work with me <laughs> because of that, and sometimes, but when they want to work, I'm very happy because I know the next performer, you know, and I make sure everybody knows whatever I was able to make <laughs> in the institution so they can go and ask for the same thing, the next people. So I think that's part of the work I do with the institutions and, and sometimes, like, you know, just having, and I don't think, I have this very, you know, confrontational situation. I, I want, when I work with institution, to have some good outcome out of it. I don't want to be like the nasty artist who is like a bitch and a diva. No, I want to be the person who is able to move forward the institution a little bit, just, mm -hmm. just a little bit, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think that's our responsibility of artists who are successful or who are called by the institution. Many times people forget, and I think we can forget. 
we need to not forget so because there are so many people behind like getting there and they need to have a nice uh, path a better path that we had mm -hmm. so i think that's a responsibility that i feel every time i work in institutions mm -hmm. and, and i also think one profound change that you make with institutions is enabling to deal with this kind of work with these kinds of audiences and people and community i mean that's actually a, it actually an even more radical shift than, than paying artists and as important as that is. And I think that's really important. But I think that having these ki this kind of art and these kind of subjects and people who, you know, I, 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 I like to live with the illusion that many people in the arts, both the artists, but at all levels of art institutions, don't have a real stake in the way the world is and agree with me in broad brushstrokes about the way the world is and how it should change in very broad brushstrokes. Where there's a lot we don't agree on, but a lot. I think that you know, and, and so I think that that giving people the opportunity to say, I mean, the Queen's Museum is an institution I like, and I think Tom's actually a really cool person. He would not have been dealing with undocumented immigrants that way, and foregrounding that as part of a conversation and using the authority of that institution to talk about those people and actually transforming those lives without you. And and so I, I think some other artists will have come with the idea. Huh? Some other artists will have come with the same idea. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, but, but some it's, would. But but I think. Yeah. But I'm not ma making you the individual. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying more but the, the project. The, the, the artists like us are actually. I mean that's. And this is good that you say that about Tom because Tom is a really nice person. Yeah. yeah. And um, <laughs> I'm sorry, but he is. And he the is. thing <laughs> is that sometimes we always see. Sometimes we see institution as the enemy. Yeah. And sometimes institutions are the people who run the institutions. Mm -hmm. They're not the buildings. And sometimes these people have good good desire, but maybe they don't know how to do the things. Or maybe they're stuck in their like bureaucracy and they don't and then maybe you can come as an artist and say, Hey, why don't we do it this way? You know, and, and if they're willing to talk. But the other thing is privilege is not something um, to live off, it's something to use. Yeah. To be used. And, and so to, to quickly answer what changes I've seen, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, you know, I, I want a radically different world. I want to get rid of this state power and to have the people have a radically different state power working to eliminate classes and exploitation. And that hasn't happened <laughs> yet, you know. Um, so is my work a failure? I don't think so. I think, I mean, I think with my work, the main thing is it's actually a battle in the realm of ideas. I mean, I think I do work with aesthetic, but I think I'm really trying to, you know, win hearts and minds to see the world, the, the, the world doesn't have to be the way that it is. And I look at particular questions, including drawing on history, um, to go at that. So going after questions about democracy, a democracy that everybody, oh, we need more democracy, the problem's lack of democracy. Well, this is a country whose democracy was rooted in the ownership of other human beings. Mm -hmm. And going back to that is not something I particularly want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think we need to escape forward. And I, I think, so putting these ideas out there, you know, going after some of the, the, the cohering norms and values. And I think people, want, those that have seen and interacted with my work, I think have started to question and destabilize that. But it's an ongoing battle. And I don't think fundamentally, as long as we have this power dictating to us, and it is, I mean, it, this is a dictatorship, but it's, it's not like, you know, the, the classic one, that, but as long as there's a power dictating to us how we live, the social relations and the economic relations that we're caught up in, people actually fundamentally can't escape from that. We actually need to get rid of that. But posing those questions and getting people to question, you know, is this permanent? Does this have to be this way all the time? I think I've brought some people to, to question some of those long-held assumptions and, and so, mm -hmm. but you know, it's, it's, it's ongoing and it, you know, when my epitaph is written and my obituary is written, you, you can tell me, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think an aspect of political art actually is, um, sounds corny, but it's hope. It's a, giving the people the chance to think that there's something else that they can do and that they can make some sort of a change. Mm -hmm. It's hope and ideas and it's fight, it's battle. I mean, it's, it's a struggle, so yeah. Last question or comment? <laughs> no. Um, Dred, uh, regarding your, uh, the slave rebellion reenactment yeah. that you were talking about, um, I know it's a long-term thing and there's probably not a 
definite time frame for when this is going to be ready, but a rough guesstimate maybe. And I was wondering, um, is this something that you're going to have here in New York exclusively, or are you going to? Okay. No. Is okay. There anything so. Else you'd like to say about that? Okay. So I will talk briefly about that because we got a show to see. But the, the Slave Rebellion reenactment, the, the, there are lots of things that have, I mean, I've been working on it for a couple of years. I'm desperately trying to do it in 2017. The key holdup is I need somebody to write an $800,000 check. So if you can do that, I can do this really soon. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's like, there, you know, there, there's a lot in motion, but that's, that's the bottleneck. That's the key bottleneck. There are other bottlenecks, but that's the key one. And it's actually going to be reenacted in New Orleans, on the, well, on the outskirts of New Orleans, on the locations that were previously sugar plantations and are now oil refineries and trailer parks and gated communities and strip malls. And so the location is there. It's going to be for two days, and people will, and, and there's more to it than that. I mean, the the process of the reenactors embodying this history is actually going to be mirroring the structure of how slave rebellions had to be planned, and that is clandestinely by word of mouth. And so there's part of it that's actually already going on. It's happening. Um, and, but the, the big epic thing is, you know, if things go really well, I'll be doing it in around March 2017. But that, that's, I can't set a date yet, because I, but I will say, here's a plug, this is a new book that's out. I'm a published author now of sorts. There's a book that just came out. Um, and this is not a book. If it, if it was, it'd be really thin. But this is a plug for the book uh, of, called Fragments of the Peculiar Institution. It's sort of my archive of, of, of slavery and my research. And so if you guys want more information, you can get this one piece of paper from me, and you could order it or just have a piece of paper. So um, this has been really cool. I mean, I really appreciate yeah, being on stage with you. And in... In the Brooklyn Museum, as part of Agitprop, this is, I think, I hope you guys have enjoyed this, but it's a great way to begin a really important and cool show with artists that I love and the history that's important. And so let's go see that. And, and yeah. So.